Welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending today our webinar. Um, so there's some access information on the screen for you. And we're going to be talking, as you know, about recent amendments to the New York State discrimination and harassment and pay equity laws. So even in the title, you get a sense of how comprehensive these changes are. There's a lot to talk about. Um, please feel free to email in your questions if you have any, and we'll get to them as time allows. Uh, and to introduce who we are, uh, Laura Lestrade is joining us from our New York City office, and she is a senior attorney who's been practicing employment law since 1992 and represents employers of all aspects of employment law, counseling, litigation, the full spectrum. And my name is Jillian Kornblatt. I'm a partner in our Minneapolis office, but I have to say a former New Yorker myself, uh, so very interested in this topic. And I also represent employers in all facets of employment law advice, litigation, investigation. So with that, we will get started. And uh, Laura is going to give us an overview of what we're talking about today. Thank you, Jillian, for that introduction. And thank you all for joining us today as we discuss recent amendments to New York State employment law. If you've been following the recent changes in New York law and your head is spinning, you're not alone. It seems as though every day there is some new change to take into consideration. The most significant changes occurred last year no doubt in response to the Me Too movement. Uh, additional protections were put into place to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace, the most significant of which was mandatory sexual harassment trainings of, training of all employees, not just management employees, as in some other states, but all employees of all employers regardless of the size of employer. This year, Many of those protections have been extended to all protected classes under New York law and not just to claims of sexual harassment. These amendments were signed by Governor Cuomo in July of this year and go into effect on varying dates. So our main focus today will be on those most recent amendments. And uh, as Jillian said, we have a lot of material to go over and not much time to do it. So um, let's dig right in. We're going to be discussing a host of topics today. Um, the most recent changes to uh, the standard for establishing sexual for establishing harassment and retaliation claims, the elimination of the Farragher Ellerth defense under New York State law, additional sexual harassment training requirements expanded coverage of the New York State human rights law to cover um, small employers and non-employees uh, for all in all protected classes, not just on sexual harassment claims, expanded remedies available to claimants, including attorney's fees and punitive damages, which were never available before under the New York State uh, statute, uh, an extended statute of limitation for agency claims, uh, an expanded ban on non-disclosure provisions in settlement agreements, an expanded ban on mandatory arbitration provisions, although it, when we talk about this later, we'll see that those may or may not come into effect and may be preempted by federal law. Um, expanded coverage for pay equity claims. This is one of the more significant changes that recently were made. Um, uh, expanded sa salary history ban requirements, and brand new race-based hairstyle discrimination ban. So uh, without further ado, I think we could get right into um, our first slide. Yeah, so our first slide, we're talking about relaxed standards for establishing harassment and retaliation claims. So to me, this, this is a huge, huge game changer. Um, so Laura, can you tell us a little bit about this? Oh, it absolutely is a game changer. This change has received a lot of coverage in legal publications and has caused a fair amount of angst among uh, New York Employment Defense Council. Um, up until now, and really up until September 10th, 2019, when the effective date of this amendment uh, will be, uh, a, a plaintiff claiming harassment had to show that the harassment was severe or pervasive. Um, and there's a whole body of case law uh, 
analyzing situations that would uh, come to reach that standard and defining those terms. But that case law has been made irrelevant by the amendments, which state that harassment based on inclusion in a protected class is unlawful, quote, regardless of whether such harassment would be considered severe or pervasive under precedent applied to harassment claims. So all that precedent when you're talking about a claim under the New York State human rights law is now really irrelevant. Um, and what, what court, courts are going to look at is whether the harassment subjects an individual to, in, quote, inferior terms, conditions, or privileges of employment. And rather than requiring employees to prove, to prove severe and, harass, and pervasive harassment, employers have been given a new affirmative defense if they can show that a reasonable person within the protected class would consider the conduct to be petty slights or trivial inconveniences. So that is, you know, as you said, Jillian, that's a big change. It's a significant change to shift the burden of proof from the employee to show severe and pervasive conduct to the employer to show that the conduct was nothing more than petty slights or trivial inconveniences. Yeah, and so I see that this section is not going to be applied retroactively, um, but to conduct going forward, do you have a sense of what employers should envision that the courts will do when they're interpreting these new provisions? Well, it's it's hard to say, although there there is, even though the case law on under the severe and pervasive standard is now really deemed irrelevant by the statute, um, New York City employers have really been operating under this um, standard for quite some time. And uh, so there is a body of case law that talks about what would be considered a um, petty slight or mere inconvenience, or sometimes it's talked about in terms of de minimis conduct. In fact, there's a very recent case out of the Second Circuit uh, in which the employee said that after she complained of harassment, she was yelled at, her work was scrutinized more closely, and um, she uh, had a, a couple of other isolated incidents. And the court said that those were insufficient to change the terms and conditions of employment and were more in the nature of petty slights. So there will be some case law to rely on. It's really hard to say you know, for a court to say, well, you know, what, what constitutes inferior terms and conditions or privileges of employment? Doesn't there have to be some level of severity or pervasiveness? So um, there's been a lot of angst over this, but, and a lot of discussion, well, maybe is New York's law becoming a general civility statute, you know, but employees will still have to connect the harassment and retaliation to either their inclusion in, in a protected class or a complaint of, um, of a violation of the statute. So, you know, harassment needs to be, to be unlawful, needs to be because of a, an employee's sex, age, race, et cetera. Um, I don't think there's, I don't think there's as much to be afraid of as some people are afraid. Um, but I do think that it remains to be seen how courts are going to interpret this new standard. Yeah, it's such an interesting topic. Our state legislature here went through a process of considering legislation by this recently, and, and there was a lot of talk of, you know, the severe, pervasive, how has that been interpreted to, to make it very severe or very pervasive? Um, and so there's a lot of levels down to what would be petty, slight, or trivial inconvenience. Uh, going to the next topic, the elimination of the Farragher Ellers defense. How, how does this happen, Laura? Well, the uh, the statute essentially says that um, that the fact that an individual did not make a complaint about the harassment to, to the employer shall not be determinative of whether such an employer shall be liable. So. Um, I think that, you know, that, that eliminates an important uh, defense for employers 
And I don't know, you know, it, it, it could discourage some employers from really caring too much about whether they have these complaint procedures in place. That would be a mistake because, I mean, as we'll see later, having complaint procedures in place are, it, it is the law when we talk when we talk later about the um, training requirements there is a requirement for a written policy that has a complaint procedure but um, you know another valuable uh, reason to have complaint procedures is I think you know together with the relaxation of the standard for harassment and retaliation claims uh, Employers need to be pretty vigilant, need to be more vigilant that their employees are behaving. And having a complaint procedure helps you to be vigilant. Um, if someone comes in with a complaint, the complaint should be investigated. And um, it might eliminate, it does eliminate this uh, defense in New York State, but it's still valuable to have a complaint procedure in place. Um, I think that uh, it is essential. Yeah, th that's a really good point, Laura. And I think sometimes employment lawyers may get, you know, we get, we like to get down into the weeds of the legal standard and case law and how it will play out. But, you know, it's important for us to all keep in sight that the primary goal of this is to stop sexual harassment. So as you said, having a robust procedure with complaint procedures lets the employer know what's going on and uh, helps them to eliminate anything that may be happening that's in violation of their policy or their standard. Of course, it, the Farragut-Ellis defense is still available under federal law, um, but my guess is that given a choice of which law to go with, uh, a lot of people will probably choose to bring claims under the state law rather than risking uh, removal to federal court. Do you have any thoughts on how that's playing out? I don't, I think that remains to be seen, but I think that is a very fair um, assessment. I think that, you know, we already see a fair number of claims where employees just go, they go into state court because state court can be easier. Uh, and, and especially, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that New York City, for, your, for the New York City employers out there, New York City already has had this relaxed standard for harassment and retaliation. They got rid of uh, severe and pervasive quite a long time ago and, and, and put into place the um, petty slights or trivial inconveniences. So um, we already see a lot of employees going straight to the New York City uh, law because it is so much more... Um, uh, liberal. And in terms of when you were asking about how courts are going to interpret these new changes, um, New York City has had pretty much the most liberal uh, and most employee-friendly discrimination law in the country for a long time now. And these changes do bring New York State in line with New York City. Um, so some of this stuff is not really new to a lot of our clients because many of them who even, especially from out of state, who might have employees in New York already have them in New York City. Um, and in terms of what to do about this, I think training your employees, tra especially your managers on the new standard um, is a way you know, it, it is something that really needs to be done. And I've done a lot of trainings where I talk extensively about uh, severe or pervasive standard um, and into New York State employers, and, and I'm going to have to change that, and uh, employers are going to have to look at their template trainings and make sure that uh, the new standard is, is, um, is taught. Um, I think training managers is essential. Sometimes they, they come to the training and they, and they, they walk away and they, they barely remember it the next day. I think one way to get their attention is to educate them on the availability of individual liability under New York State law. So, uh, you know. Yeah, I think. Yeah, go on, Laura. Sorry. Yeah, no, that, I think that, that's huge for, for, for some people. You, when, when they understand that, you know, you know, my, my, my employer might back me up, but I'm, I will still be hauled into court and it will be a huge inconvenience for me. Um. Yeah, definitely. 
And, and the interesting thing also about this is it eliminates the requirement for plaintiffs to identify comparators, which is interesting because it seems to me that that's a primary way to tell if the terms and conditions of someone's employment have been altered by comparing what's happened with their colleagues um, who haven't had this alleged harassment happen. Absolutely. I think it's very, I, I think it's, it strikes me as a little bit odd, actually, although I suppose, you know, these, um, the, the standard for harassment and retaliation and, and the Farragher-Eller elimination really is, is geared towards sexual harassment. So I kind of get it there. Um, if you're being harassed on the basis of your uh, inclusion in a protected class, I suppose sometimes, you know, it doesn't matter how anybody else was treated, but when you turn, talk in terms of I was, um, uh, you know, I, I was uh, terminated or treated unfairly in some non-harassment way, I, I do think it's really difficult to, if you don't have, if you're not, if an employee is not required to identify a comparator, I don't know how you, how you make an assessment of the, whether right, there was discrimination. And I suppose it remains to be seen whether employers choose to proactively compare other employees as their defense, even if the employee is not required to identify it. So, and I'm going to note that uh, this is, takes place September 10th. One thing I've noticed about these amendments is the different pieces all seem to have a range of dates when they are uh, going to effect. Do you have any insight on why that is? No, I mean, not some of them I understand it. For example, uh, when we get to this later, the small employer uh, inclusion, you know, extending the human rights law coverage to small employers, that just might give them a, a, a running start to try to get, get themselves together for that because it's brand new to them. But, yeah, others I don't really know why, uh, why, why they chose these different uh, effective dates. Yeah. Well, your thought on letting small employers have ramp-up time makes a lot of sense. Well, turning, you mentioned sexual harassment training just a few minutes ago when you were talking about teaching employers the standard, uh, sorry, the severe or pervasive standard. So what's going on with the training component of this now? Yeah. So, um, so this was a sea change for employers for New York employers when in 2018 um, the legislature required annual training of all employees. Um, the first training sessions must be completed by October 9th of this year, so anyone who hasn't already tried to, you know, set that up and, and, and schedule those should, should do that soon. Um, the, those requirements, so there's some review here about what, what, what was put in place in 2018. The requirements uh, for a written sexual harassment prevention policy, including a, a complaint form. So that idea that, well, now it doesn't matter whether an employee complained in terms of determining um, an employer's liability, you know, that doesn't eliminate the need for a complaint form, a complaint procedure, because you need to include a complaint form and like we said, it's just good practice. Um, uh, so you've got, you need a written policy, a complaint form, annual interactive sexual harassment prevention, tra prevent prevention training for all employees. Um, that's a significant, you know, burden for, for employers. And that's why they were given so much time, you know, all the way until October 9th, 2019 to get that in place. Um, a sexual harassment prevention poster. Uh, most most employers have a, a, a all kinds of postings already. Um, but now the recent amendments require that new employees must be given a copy of the policy and the most re recent training materials upon commencement of employment, and that actually uh, went into effect immediately. So that that's that's a requirement right now. Um, the you want, would, could you advance the slide? Maybe we'll talk about of the course. training. Yeah. yeah, I will. And I was just going to say it's interesting because it, 
it sounds like the legislature doesn't want new employees to be without the training for even a day. So if you know they've hired, they've been hired six months into the training year, they'll get the copy when they start. So it's really you know from the get go they're aware of the training. Yeah, it is. It is. At, you know, and for for employers who are constantly hiring new people, it's it it requires your onboarding. Um, uh, procedures to be changed, and um, and it's important that that this be done immediately, as you said. Um, so the training, the requirements of the training, um, and I said we were going to focus on the new uh, amendments, but I think this is worth going over. This this is what was put into place last year. Um, an explanation of sexual harassment consistent with DOL guidance. Now, on the next slide we'll see the, the New York State Department of Labor has put together a comprehensive set of documents, model uh, policies, model complaint form, all kinds of things. And I, you know, it's, ni it, you know, it's, it's nice to have things um, custom, but my recommendation to employers in New York is take the New York State Department of Labor um, form and just conform it to your, you know, you really, it takes a minimal um, revision, but I would just use the one that they have. Um, so I would definitely take advantage of the materials. There's a policy, a model policy. There's a, a guidance as well. I mean, I really think that Going onto their website is is immensely helpful. Um, there's the poster is there, the complaint form. They have a model training, which is a PowerPoint. Um, the training case studies, which is it also is in the form of a PowerPoint. You just put that up at the end of your training. Um, they even have videos, um, and employers can use their videos, even though the the training has to be interactive. As long as you allow an employee um, to give feedback, and unfortunately the, the Department of Labor isn't that specific about how an employee is supposed to be allowed to do that, I think if there's a feedback form and they could send in questions that then, become, that then are answered later, I think that's, um, that appears to be sufficient. Um, yeah, so it's sounds like it's you know employers have this new burden of training annually and from the get-go for new employees but a lot of the materials are provided I, I agree I think it rather than reinvent the wheel and risk having something missing to use theirs as at least as a starting place and then maybe add on some company policies makes makes a lot of sense and Absolutely. New York and New York State employers can use the New York City materials even if they're not in New York City well it's really, I think the easiest thing is for New York State employee, employers, if they're not in New York City, to use the New York State materials. But, you know, at the same time that New York State uh, enacted these amendments and required this training, New York City did as well. And the New York City requirements are a little different. Even when you look at the New York State Department of Labor website, it says, uh, it, it kind of encourages employers in New York City to use the New York City training materials because those are um, compliant for both New York City and New York State. That that makes that sense. makes sense. Yeah, because New York so, City is a little different too. Uh, yeah. And so expanded coverage of the New York State human rights law, and you touched on this earlier. This is one of the pieces that's not going in place until January of 2020. Yes. Um, you know, historically, the New York State human rights law applied only to employers with four or more employees. Last year, the protections against sexual harassment under the law were extended to employers of all sizes. Now, uh, in July, um, the protections all of the protections of the New York State human rights law were extended to all employers regardless of size. So that is a big change and a big burden for, um, for small employers. Um, you know, yeah. even just, just a training, you know, a training for two employees is, uh, 
you know, it seems to be somehow more costly than training, you know, 100 employees. It seems seems uh, as though it would be difficult for them to have the resources and to get um, the training in place. So I think that's why that this was uh, given such a long lead time. Right, and and of course they can use the the New York State training materials, but they have to come up with policies as well. Yeah, yeah, and and um, so the uh, the training materials, like I said, they're not they're not cook they're not ready made. You will have to um, you will have to uh, add in your own, you know, who the employee should call. How they how they could complain, you know the contact information. So, but it is fairly uh, minimal. Yeah. So moving on. So this also strikes me as one of the biggest changes here. Can you tell us about this expanded coverage provision? Yes. So historically, the New York Human Rights Law applied only to employees and not to others in the workplace, such as independent contractors. And, you know, I myself have defended and won and had cases dismissed on the, on the, on the ground, you know, not only that there was no discrimination, but because the uh, complainant was a, an independent contractor. So um, this adds a, you know, a, a huge class of um, potential plaintiffs and claimants to the scene. Um, and while last year the protections against sexual harassment were extended to non-employees, uh, this year all of the protections uh, of the human rights law are extended to non-employees in the workplace. And they're extended to non-employees when the employer, its agents or supervisors, knew or should have known that such employee, non-employee was subject to discrimination and fails and the employer fails to take immediate and appropriate remedial action. So that standard is better for employers than essentially the strict liability that an employer faces when, for example, a supervisory employee is harassing or discriminating against a subordinate employee. Um, you know, this there's a lot of attention on independent contractors in the workplace because, you know, we're, we're constantly telling uh, clients that you, you can't treat these people like employees. The more you treat them like employees, the less likely you're going to maintain their independent status and all of the benefits, financial benefits that, that go with that. So, um, so here we have you know, we're not, these people are not supposed to be employees, but yet now they're given the protection that all of the other employees have. Um, but, yeah, you know, I had the same thought about blurring the lines potentially, and, and if this maybe will act as somewhat of a disincentive for employers to uh, consider people independent contractors, since now the, the state laws will apply to them. Yeah, That's I mean... Yeah, there'll there'll still be some financial advantages, but um, you know, there you do have to make sure that you're treating uh, these people not like employees. So there was a question: Well, um, should you train your independent contractors? Uh, there is no requirement. Uh, the new training requirements don't apply to independent contractors. Um, but I think that it. it, it it behooves employers to make it clear that everyone in the workplace is uh, protected and, and should be treated with respect and not, not discriminatorily or, or, or and, and should not be harassed on, on any protected basis. Yeah, I agree. And you know, going back to our conversation earlier about how it's so important for the employer to learn what's going on so that they can stop it, this supervisor should have known provision really prevents what I would call the ostrich defense of saying, you know, we didn't know this was going on. It, it sounds like it would be important to know what's happening with your independent contractors and uh, make sure that they are know who to go to if they have an issue so that it can be dealt with. 
Yeah. I'm also curious about the non-employees in the workplace. So does that mean if I'm operating a, a retail store or a restaurant and uh, the customer in the establishment feels they're subject to sexual harassment that they would be covered as well? Yes, I believe so. Wow. And, and also, is- yeah, and, and, and this isn't new, but, you know, if, if your employee is being harassed uh, by a customer, that, that as well would be um, actionable. So you really kind of have to have your eyes open to, you know, <laughs> what everyone is doing, whether they're your employee or not. Right, and I think that that is actually often can be a trickier issue to deal with because, you know, the mentality of the customer is always right. I think employees may have a little bit of a, uh, feel a little more awkward saying something to a customer or about a customer. Absolutely. I think that's a problem in a lot of, um, a lot of situations. Yeah, and so that looks like the remedies are expanded as well. Yes. Um, for the first time, attorney's fees and punitive damages uh, will be available under the New York State Human Rights Law. And, you know, that makes a difference in terms of, um, you know, what, what claims can we knock out? You know, it's great if you can knock out the, uh, the federal claims because then you'll knock out the punies um, and attorney's fees, but, um, you know, now... Uh, there's really no there, there's no statute even the New York City law already provides for punitive damages and attorney's fees so there's no there's no uh, there used to be some respite oh, well at least there are no attorney's fees and punitive damages but that's that's no longer the case right and this again makes this, this uh, statute more attractive for plaintiffs. Absolutely. And also the statute of limitations change, and that one is uh, also has a delayed period to go into effect, which is interesting because there's not really anything for employers to do, except I would say uh, this may affect record keeping. Yeah, I'm not really sure the rationale for this one, but you know, in terms of litigation, it really won't have much of a practical effect because in um, because the the statute of limitations for a a uh, court filed litigation under the um, human rights law is already three years, and unlike the federal scheme where you're required to exhaust um, administrative remedies and file an EEOC charge first, the opposite is true in New York. You don't need to file. Um, a, um, a complaint with the State Division of Human Rights before going into court. So you could, you already could have gone straight into court um, on a three-year statute of limitations. I think, you know, I guess this would affect mainly uh, pro se plaintiffs or you know people with limited means who can now rely on the State Division of Human Rights. Um, even if they've um, blown the one-year statute of limitations. Right. And so, so yeah, so based on the fact that the, the court it, you had three years, that it, what you're saying, I think, is employers should already be keeping their records in a way that they can trace back what they've done with internal complaints or their policies in place for the three-year period anyway. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a long time in today's world, three years. A lot, a lot can change in three years. People come and go. Uh, that, that's a lot to, that's a long time. Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and just, and you know, and, and, and how slow some of these litigations move. Um, uh, adding, adding three years on top of that. So you've got a three-year statute of limitations. You have something filed on the eve of the of the expiration, and then and then it doesn't go to trial for five years. That's a great point. That's a really good point. So non-disclosure of settlement agreements uh, effective date January 1, 2020. And I'll let you tell us some more details. But I wonder, will employers be in a a push to get some claims settled before the end of this year? 
Oh, that's a good point. Um, yeah, so last year, to review, um, the law was amended to preclude non-disclosure provisions in agreements settling sexual harassment claims. Um, unless the condition of confidentiality is the complainant's preference. So I am, it's interesting, uh, you know, I suppose... I suppose a complainant might want, serial complainants might want that. I have a case with a serial co a plaintiff, so maybe she might want an, she might, uh, she might have wanted that. But anyway, um, the recent amendments extend that prohibition against employer-imposed confidentiality agreements to agreements settling any type of unlawful discrimination. So um, if you want a confidentiality provision in your settlement agreement, you can only put it in if it's, the if it's the complainant's preference. And then even if it is the complainant's preference, um, could you advance the, the slide? Yep. So We're even there. where, yeah, great, thanks. So even where confidentiality is the complainant's preference, um, <clears throat> He or she needs to be given 21 days to consider the provision and seven days to revoke it after signing. So, you know, we're all probably familiar with that 21 and 7 um, formula for uh, waiving um, age discrimination claims. But um, so, so that is another protection for the complainant who might think that he or she wants a, a confidentiality provision, but then might change uh, his or her mind. Um, the, the, that preference for confidentiality has to be memorialized in a separate document. So, um, you know, I don't know, could be an email, I suppose, or some kind of a letter, something I think signed by the complainant. Um, the provision cannot restrict a complainant from participating in an investigation by a government agency or prohibit the disclosure, disclosure of facts necessary to receive public benefits. So um, it's, it's unlikely, I think, that uh, there would be a provision that specifically says you can't participate in an investigation by a government agency. I think most employers are savvy enough to know not to do that. Um, but then the next bullet point there, if you want uh, to enter in an agree into an agreement that uh, that prevents disclosure of future claims. So this would be like an agreement entered into at the commencement of employment, for example. Um, uh, the the agreement itself has to notify the employee or potential employee that it doesn't prohibit him or her from speaking with law enforcement, the EEOC, the State Division of Human Rights, uh, local state or local you know agencies or an attorney, an attorney uh, retained by the employee. So there are, you know, significant protections in place to, um, to ensure that it is, in fact, the complainant's preference uh, to, uh, to, to have that non-disclosure provision in the settlement agreement. Yeah, that is, that is a definite uh, change, and I'm curious to see if you have people who are pretty open about their settlement agreements. I, I anticipate that in some cases where there may be a potential for publicity, we will see that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so mandatory arbitration provisions, so that is yeah. the type of thing that an employer may give to an employee on the front end at the beginning of employment. Absolutely. As you were just saying. Yeah. So what changes so, do we see here? Well, um, I see you see I have the effective date on there, September 10th, maybe. Um, and I'll, um, I'll explain that uh, a little bit. So last year, uh, the arbitration provisions of the, of the CPLR, the Civil Practice Law and Rules, was amended to prohibit mandatory arbitration of sexual harassment claims. Recent amendments... Um, preclude mandatory arbitration of any type of unlawful discrimination claim. Uh, now, man, uh, arbitration provisions have kind of come under fire by um, uh, employees' rights groups and consumer rights groups because, uh, you know, the, the, I think the, um, the argument is that 
large employers, you know, have arbitrators that they use, and they have, they're at an advantage, and, and, they, and these things are somehow um, uh, pro-employer and not, not very friendly to employees. So there's been a lot of pushback on these kinds of provisions. Um, New York here, clearly the legislature seems to believe that they're not, uh, that, that, that they disfavor employees. However, um, there's a federal law, the Federal Arbitration Act, uh, that preempts, according to at least one court in New York, preempts um, limitations on mandatory uh, employ uh, arbitration and employment uh, agreements. Uh, there is a very recent case, Latif versus Morgan Stanley. Um, the employee signed a um, a mandatory arbitration provision at the commencement of employment, uh, sued for, uh, you know, had several different claims, including a sexual harassment claim. Uh, the employer uh, uh, tried to get that uh, thrown out in favor of a mandatory arbitration, and um, the uh, Southern District of New York sided with the employer, uh, ordering arbitration of the sexual harassment claim uh, on the basis that the New York law, and this was the um, the 2018 amendment, so the amendment that simply um, expanded, uh, uh, that prohibited mandatory arbitration of sexual harassment claims only, said that that um, is preempted by the FAA. And in a footnote, uh, opined that the most recent amendments uh, uh, expanding that, that prohibition to any type of unlawful discrimination uh, claim would also be preempted. So mandatory yeah, arbitration, yeah, might not be dead yet in New York. Yeah, and that certainly makes sense that it wouldn't come down to the type of discrimination alleged. So, yeah, I would expect we would see this going up to the Second Circuit. Yeah. And um, and now, oh, thanks, Laura. Um, now moving on to a, a bit of a different subject, but also part of this law is pay equity, and that is a huge issue in today's employment law world. Um, and in this one, we it doesn't go into effect for another month or two. Can you tell us about this? Yes, this is um, this is a very significant change. Um, currently, New York's pay equity p provisions apply only to pay inequality based on sex, and that's you know very common. Most of the equal pay act claim uh, statutes, if not all of them, apply to uh, sex only. Um, the recent amendments extend the protections to pay inequality based on any of the protected classes under the New York State Human Rights Law. So I've listed them out here. Uh, pay equity now applies to age, race, creed, color, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, military status, sex, disability, predisposing genetic characteristics, familial status, marital status, and domestic violence victim status. I listed those because I, I think that a lot of people listening to that might say, how the heck am I going to know um, whether an employee fits into one of these protected classes? And that yeah, is yeah. a challenge, I think. Absolutely. As you were saying when we talked earlier, that this, a lot of these the employer would not know. And we also talked about doing a pay equity study is a big undertaking, even where you're only looking at perhaps two or three types of comparisons. But to do this many types of comparisons is huge. Um, I'd say good news for all the statisticians out there because their help will certainly be more needed in these pay equity studies. Uh, but I'm curious to see how how this happens and if it increases the uh, likelihood companies do pay equity or if it makes it so complicated that they're more likely just to say, it's too hard, we're not going to touch it. Yeah, I mean, they would have to slice it and dice it so many different ways. Um, so not, you know, 
not only do we have we extended the protections to all protected classes, but um, the law relaxes the standard for making the claims. Um, an employee now must show that he or she is paid less than someone outside of the protected class for performing, quote, substantially similar work. Currently, the standard is equal work. So that, um, that relaxed standard increases the number of comparators an employee might use to establish an equal pay claim. So we've got kind of a double whammy here. Um, yeah, I agree that you know determining what is substantially similar work is in and of itself a big undertaking and a difficult one. And then it also occurs to me, I'm sure a lot of our listeners uh, at this presentation today are with employers, with employees in many states, and we're seeing all these pay equity laws pop up, and the standards are different across the different state regimes, federal, and it, it does just make it more complicated. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, I maybe, I think maybe the only way to deal with it, in, in, unless you have the resources and, you know, uh, time to do this kind of huge across-the-board study of, you know, how many different uh, uh, classes, is, you know, notwithstanding these significant changes, um, New York State still allows for pay differentials based on non-discriminatory factors such as seniority, merit, quantity or quality of work, or a bona fide factor such as education, training, or experience provided that it's job-related and consistent with business needs. So, you know, I think that try to keep keep the eye on that ball, um, you know, rather than are we, are we treating the, um, uh, you know, pick a, someone with a predisposing genetic characteristic different than everyone else, are we, are, is our pay um, scale, uh, you know, based on seniority, merit, quantity, or quality of work and these other bona fide factors? Um, you know, with a with a blind eye towards towards the the protected classes in a way, um, I don't really know. It's it's very difficult to uh, to for I think a, a smaller medium sized employer to 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 marshal the resources to do one of those studies. So um, yeah, I I agree. And unlike a lot of things, this one isn't. You do a pay equity comparison once, and then you know a few annual increases and bonuses. Different, you know, later you could have a difference again if you're not, as you said, tying it to one of these more concrete things that are um, that form a basis that would not be considered discriminatory in this yeah. situation. Yeah, and it so, is good. All right, go on, Laura. No, I did. <laughs> no, you go ahead. Oh, you know what? I think we should just move to the next slide, which is the salary history ban. Um, okay. And this one, you, I think, relates very closely to what we were just talking about, even though it's a slightly different take. Yes. So um, this is kind of a, a, a strange um, uh situation here where this the first part is seems very straightforward employer can't rely uh, inquire about or rely on wage or salary history in making decisions concerning hiring promotion or salary increases so that's not that new I mean New York City already had a salary history ban um, banning inquiry into salary history um, but then the, the law goes on to say Nothing, however, nothing shall prevent an applicant or current employee from voluntarily and without prompting disclosing or verifying wage or salary history, including but not limited to for the purposes of negotiating wages or salary. So let's say an employee voluntarily, you know, says, oh, I was making X dollars at my old uh, firm. It's 
and employers still can't rely on that. So what do they do with that information? Um, it's it's a little odd, and I think very difficult to uh, police. Right. I think yeah, it's saying to employers, you can get this, uh, but you if you use it, if you rely on it, you you could be in a risk. And I think this comes up in a ways that are not just the, what people may consider the classic sense of sitting in an interview and saying, what's your salary history so you can determine someone's starting salary. I've had questions in the past about what happens when you acquire a company and you're setting salaries for the acquired employees and you're basing it on what they were earning in their prior organization. I've also had questions come up where if you're giving everybody in the place their annual increase, whether it's 2%, 5%, whatever it may be, that is by nature based on what they were making. And I think that percentage increase is really the most common way salary increases are done. Have you heard any thoughts or have any thoughts on how employers are thinking about those kinds of situations? No, I haven't, and Jillian, you're a genius. I didn't even think of that, actually, about the percentage increases. Um, right, that that necessarily relies on the person's salary history. Um, I think the whole thing is a little odd. I don't know what, I mean, I think that employers have to be really careful about not asking any question that could even be remotely um, perceived as, as requesting or requiring um, salary history information. Now, what if an employee just says to you, well, I won't come here unless you pay me X? You know, I, I guess yeah. to me that doesn't re rely on salary history. It, 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 that person might, it's conceivable that the person might, that might be more than he or she was making in a, at their prior off, um, in their prior employer anyway. So, that to me seems okay. So, um, but yeah, it's I agree. Um, yeah, it, it, and it I gets, agree. That's the permissible way to do it. Yeah, yeah, and it, it comes into. It's interesting. I mean, some general advice that we give to employers is when you're when you're filling a job, have a have a salary range for what you're going to pay for the job going into it. I think a lot of employers have used that what have you made in the past question because they want to pay the least amount it will take to get the person they want into the job. But if you have that in place, then you, you are not putting yourself in this situation where you, you need that prohibited information to make your decision. And you know, my understanding is a lot of these pay equity laws are put into place to combat historical discrimination, which then gets uh, perpetuated year after year, as we talked about, if your next salary is based on your last one, these changes just stay with you and never catch up. But also, my understanding is there's research out there that women often don't negotiate in the same way as men when they're when they're doing their salary negotiation. So I suppose this is kind of a freeing uh, moment because you know somebody can go in there and, and say what they their demand is and it's not it doesn't have to be tied to what they made yeah absolutely um, yeah and and it I, I I under I completely understand these laws I think you're right it it, it would per, it doesn't end up perpetuating um, and then um, you know, I think I think it's it's almost just a good practice not to rely rely on salary history in the in this day and age when you've got these pay equity statutes because you're inevitably going to you know you know be be uh, be in violation if you're really relying on salary history and and we have this history where um, unfortunately women have historically been paid less than men so I think these two things do go hand in hand. Um, yeah, I, I think this is an area that's just going to continue to grow in interest and complication. And as you know, of course, the EEOC now collecting pay data, that deadline yeah. is right around the corner. So, yes. you know, there's going to be multiple layers of assessment of this by the different government entities and different state and federal laws. 
So my personal prediction is that this will become a, a big uh, issue in employment law in the next year. Not that it isn't now. Absolutely. I think the biggest, I did, there's nothing that stirs fear more than a, 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 an Equal Pay Act claim because they're so yeah. complicated and they're so hard and they don't necessarily re, uh, require intent. Correct. And there's, yeah, there's, and there's no shortage of publicity going on with these sorts of cases yeah. that we've seen recently with the women's soccer team. Uh, yes. So moving on to one last amendment covered in here. Uh, why don't you tell us about this one, Laura? Yeah, this is actually even newer than the. This is a real. Uh, this this after everyone was talking about those the other amendments we've been discussing, this one kind of popped up. Um, this new ban on um, race discrimination based on natural hair or hairstyle. Um, uh, essentially, the definition of race in the New York State Human Rights Law has been amended to include traits historically associated with race, including, but not limited to, hair texture and protect, protective hairstyles, which I think is an interesting term, um, and it's defined to include, but not be limited to, hairstyles such as braids, locks, and twists. So it's it's a it's a race based um, discrimination, and it is um, I you know it's it's been talked about in terms of hairstyle, but um, you know the phrase traits historically associated with race uh, can can be uh, interpreted broadly. I, I I imagine, and it's not necessarily limited to. Uh, hairstyle and hair texture. So um, this is something that, uh, you know, we need to be aware of and, and, and employers need to be aware of. Yeah, I agree that traits historically associated with race could encompass so much. But the protective hairstyles, I, it seems to me, would come up the most in the context of company dress codes. Or is that one thing that is uh, a perceived place this would come into effect? Well, yes, ab absolutely. I think that um, dress codes should be probably reviewed to make sure that um, that these uh, types of hairstyles are not, um, you know, are not limited or restricted in the workplace. Yeah. So we've only got about two or three minutes left. But Laura, if you had to give advice to an employer out there who's just hearing about this and needs to get started, where, where would you say is the best? Place to start. Do you have any kind of triage suggestions on how to get compliant? Yes, I think that um, reviewing policies. I mean, making sure that you're compliant with the training requirements is is essential. I also think that um, the pay equity issue is really, like we said, probably the biggest issue here. Um, reviewing template agreements. Um, making sure that they uh, comply with the, the new non-disclosure provisions, um, you know, reviewing template trainings and, um, and vigilance. I think training your HR people, training your managers uh, is extremely important and that's to me the biggest takeaway. Yeah, I think your choice of the word vigilance is perfect, Laura. That that does seem like it's going to be in order. Well, thank you all for listening, and uh, if, uh, we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jillian.